Well, good evening, everybody, and a special welcome to all of those who are visiting Gresham College for the first time. So welcome to our singing of Gilbert and Sullivan, designed as the London launch of this wonderful book, Gilbert and Sullivan Choruses, which I'm glad to see that some of you have bought. And for those who have not yet bought it, there will be other opportunities afterwards because there is a reception, a drinks reception, after this event uh, uh, to which you are all invited. Uh, this book was recently edited with the broadcaster and conductor Brian Kay. Unfortunately, he is in conducting a music festival in Guernsey this week. But if you want to come and hear him and see him, uh, then I have shown you there's an Oxford concert on the 2nd of October, which you should all come to as well. So in the next 75 minutes or so, we'll introduce you to most of the 14 GNS operas, and you'll be meeting two kings, the Grand Duke of Fennig Halfenig, a Lord Chancellor, a Major General, a Sea Captain, an Executioner, a Magician, a Police Sergeant, and two Spin Doctors. <laughs> so to get us all off to a lively start, let's go straight into our first chorus for the merriest fellows are we, um, from the Gondoliers. For those of you who've got books, it's chorus number 23 on page 179. If you haven't yet bought the book, I'll project the pages onto the screen. And if you don't read music at all, here are the words. <laughs> have several singers here to help us, all from Oxford. The role of the gondolier Antonio has just been sung by Sheridan Edward, tenor, uh, with David Jones uh, conducting and Sam Baker as our orchestra. And we also welcome uh, Taya Smith, soprano, and jo Jordan Bell, baritone, whom you'll be hearing in a minute. Gilbert and Sullivan first met at a rehearsal of ages ago, a work written by Gilbert with music by Sullivan's friend, Frederick Clay composer of such well-known ballads as I'll, I'll Sing These Songs of Araby. Ages ago included a scene in which a picture gallery of ancestors come alive and descend from their frames. Have you ever heard of that before? This is an idea that Gilbert later revived in Rudigore. Their first collaboration was Thespis, which ran for six weeks. Most of its music is lost, though you can hear two items from it if you come to the Oxford launch of the book on the 2nd of October. But one person who saw Thespis was the theatre impresario Richard Doyley Cart, who remembered Gilbert and Sullivan three years later when he needed a short piece to follow an Offenbach opera that he was presenting in London. It was La Pericole. Uh, my friend said, Pericole, not to be confused with Nat King Como. The result was trial by jury about a case of breach of promise of marriage. 
And I thought we could sing the opening chorus, which is chorus number one on page two of your book. So if you could imagine yourself in a court of law where the trial is just about to start. Maestro. <laughs> leads straight into the Usher's song. If you want to hear that, you'll have to come to the Oxford concert. <laughs> well, after the enormous success of Trial by Jury, Dorley Cart commissioned a full-length GNS opera, and the result was The Sorcerer. It concerns a love potion which the sorcerer, John Wellington Wells, administers to a whole village at a wedding feast with predictably disastrous results. And here, in a typical GNS patter song, the sorcerer introduces himself. My name is John Wellington Wells. I'm a dealer in magic and spells. In blenders, in curses, in amethyst purses, in promises, witches and nails. If you want a crown, you be tracks. If you measure it, chunkle in wax. You butt your looking on the red of the chin number 70 simmery acts. We were first read assortment of magic, and for raising a posthumous shade, with effects that are comic or tragic, there's no deeper house in the trade. Love filter with quantities of it, and for knowledge if anyone burns. We keep in a very small pocket of puppet who brings the sun down and returns. For you can prophesy with the wind of his eye, through security, into maturity, some of your history. If you were for a for a nativity, for a nativity, for a nativity. With mirrors so magical, telephone spectacles, very spectacular, answers so regular, factors too logical, solemn or comical, and if you want to see nature, a junction of tips like quantity, oh, if anyone anything lacks, he'll find it already in sacks. If you'd only look in on the resident chin, number 70, Simaria. He can raise you hosts of ghosts, boom, and that without reflectors, and creepy things with wings, and gaunt and grisly spectres. He can fill you brows of trows, and horrify you vastly. He can wreck your brains with chains, and gibbering grim and ghastly. Then you plan it, he changes organity with an amenity full of satanity, victor's humanity with an inanity, fatal to vanity, driving your foes to the verge of insanity. Barring tautology, in demonology, lectrobiology, mystic pathology, spirit phrenology, hypothetology, such as knowledge, he isn't the man that acquired an apology. Oh! My name is John Wellington Wells. I'm a dealer in magic and spells. In deaths, in curses, in ever filled purses, in prophecies, witches, and nails. And if anyone anything lacks, he'll find it already in sacks. If he'd only look in on the resident in number 70, Simaria. The Sorcerer had a moderately successful run and was succeeded by HMS Pinafore, which started with the poor audiences due to an unusually hot summer until Sullivan included some of the music in a promenade concert. And Pinafore was soon the smash hit of London. The story is set on board ship and features Josephine, the captain's daughter. 
Her father wishes her to marry Sir Joseph Porter, the First Lord of the Admiralty, but she's secretly in love with a common sailor on board ship with whom she plans to elope. And in this trio, the three of them discuss the awkward situation. HMS Pinafore was a victim of its own success. In New York alone, there were no fewer than eight simultaneous pirated versions, none having much in common with the original production. Gilbert and Sullivan received no royalties for these performances and vowed to beat the pirates of their own game with their next opera, appropriately, The Pirates of Penzance, which they took to New York before bringing it to London. In our first pirates extract, the pirates have captured the daughters of Major General Stanley, but agree to release them on learning that the Major General is, like them, an orphan. Led by the pirate king, all raise their voices in praise of poetry, for some bizarre reason. This is chorus number seven on page 39, and it's preceded by a short recitative by the pirate king. Without a touch of poetry. 
going to give you a break, a bit of a break from singing, while we present some solo and ensemble items. One thing I didn't tell you about our multi-talented conductor is that he's a final year chemistry student at Oxford University, and he's asked me if he could tell you a little bit about what his subject is all about. Oxygen and nitrogen and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, and americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and astatine, and radium, gold, productinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. Gadolinium, niobium, iridium, strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. And phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium, and manganese and mercury, molybdenum and magnesium, dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium, lead, praseodymium and platinum and plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium, tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium, and cadmium, calcium, and chromium, and curium. Californium and fermium, berkelium, and also mendelavium, einsteinium, nobelium, and argo ketonium, radium, zinc, and zinc, rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard, and there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. Never let it be said there isn't some educational value in a, in a Gresham lecture. <laughs> Which there certainly isn't in the next one. Because I'd like to sing you also something from Pirates. Uh, here is my helmet. <laughs> and my truncheon. Which I bought with a truncheon voucher. Uh, would you please join in the refrains for this one? Um, because this is Gresham College, uh, the, in the Gresham College the re lectures were always originally in... English and Latin, and I always gave my Gresham lectures in English, so I think I'd better sort of make up for that, and we are all from Oxford, so we're going to sing it in Latin, <laughs> and you must join in uh, the refrains. <laughs> Proud, proud dato, abrogatis, abrogatis, seco meditato nil nefari, si innocentis eret capax voluptatis, voluptatis, secut ego, secut tu, et ceteri, ceteri, e quam mentem non equibilet sevare, et sevare, quando transigentum es negotium, vis ne hoc et illo bene compensare, how this grot of vita capitali um. Oh, quando transigentum es negotium, negotium. How this grot of vita capitali um, tali um. Quando de 
racing with Tholosus for Ferrari. For Ferrari. Et archivibus Sicarius Bacart. Us Bacart. Et je written the Sosaurus Auscultari. Auscultari. Et agrestis Hydus Hymnus Adamat. Adamat. Um in Maltro Calposatis Unsultarit. Unsultarit. In the Proco Sole Querit Otium. Otium. Si quis hoc et illud bene compensavit. Compensavit. How det grata vita capitalium. After the Pirates of Penzance came Patience, a skit on the then current aesthetic movement of Oscar Wilde and others. The story concerns the poet Reginald Bunthorne, who is madly loved by the maidens of the village to the evident disgust of the 35th Dragoon Guards to whom they had been in engaged only a year earlier. The upshot is that the Colonel, the Major and the Duke are forced to become as aesthetic as the lovesick maidens.
By this time, the GNS operas had become so popular that Richard Doyle Cart built a special theatre for them. This was the Savoy Theatre, the first public building in the world to be lit by electricity. And the shows soon became known as the Savoy Operas. Patience moved into the Savoy in October 1881, and the first new opera to open there was its successor, Iolanthe, a story that combines fairyland and parliament and includes some of Gilbert's wittiest lines and Sullivan's finest music. We present the Act Two trio, Faint Heart, Never One Fair Lady. Iolanthe's successor was Princess Ida, which the Oxford University GNS Society recently performed to great acclaim at the International GNS Festival in Buxton. Containing some of Sullivan's finest music, it's based on Tennyson's The Princess, which in turn uh, was a skit on the new women's colleges that were then opening in Oxford and Cambridge. Princess Ida, who was married in infancy to Prince Hilarion, has founded a, a women's university that rejects men entirely. Hilarion, with his two friends Cyril and Florian, enter the college to claim his bride. And they dress up as women undergraduates. And incidentally, this gown I'm wearing is a doily cart costume uh, worn by uh, the men dressed up as women um, undergraduates. This, in fact, is the gown worn by the great Savoyars, Thomas Lawler and John Aylden on stage. Uh, so I'm very proud to wear this. Anyway, Hilarion has gone in with Cyril and, and Florian. They dress up as women undergraduates, but unfortunately Cyril gets drunk and gives the game away in his celebrating kissing song. Ha! 
kind of maid sets my heart aflame. Eyes must be downcast and shame, live my plot for shame. She may never trance my soul, but still you're in everything. Hang her head in modest way, without lips, without lips. Not seem to say, oh, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. No, I die of shame. Please, you, that's the kind of maid sets my heart to blame. Kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. No, I die of shame. Please, you, that's the kind of maid sets my heart to blame. <laughs> The maid is bold and gay with a tongue of flavor. Lord, she is in bravery. May the maid go hang her. Sons are gay and holy. Neither shall my garden stop. Mine the blushing rose of May with pouting lips, with pouting lips. Not seem to say. Princess Ida was not a great success and was succeeded by revivals of earlier operas. The partnership, about to break up, was saved, apparently, by a chance happening. A Japanese sword in Gilbert's house became dislodged and fell to the floor. A Japanese exhibition was taking place in London at the time and everything Japanese was fashionable. Gilbert had an idea and the Ricardo, or the town of Titipu, was the result. And we're going to have two items from this. On a tree by a river, little Tom Tit sang willow, tit willow, tit willow. And I said to him, Dickie Bird, why do you sit singing willow, tit willow, tit willow? Is it weakness of intellect, birdie, I cried, or a rather tough worm in your little inside? With a shake of his poor little hand, he replied, oh, willow, Tit willow, tit willow. He slapped at his chest as he sat on that bow, singing willow, tit willow, tit willow. And a cold perspiration bespangled his brow. Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. He sobbed and he sighed and a gurgle he gave. Then he plunged himself into the billowy wave. A manacle arose from the suicide's grave. Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. I feel just as sure as I'm sure that my name isn't Willow, Tit Willow, Tit Willow. That twas blighted affection that made him exclaim, Oh Willow, Tit Willow, Tit Willow. And if you remain callous and obdurate, I'll 
shall perish as he did, and you will know why. Though I probably shall not exclaim as I die, Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. The other song from the Mikado is the Little List song, and here the words were written by Glenn Wilson, who is currently Gresham's visiting professor of psychology. <laughs> Someday it may happen that a victim must be found. I've got a little list, I've got a little list of society offenders who might well be underground, who never would be missed. They never would be missed. There's the bankers who are bailed out but still take their bonus hikes. And British Airways cabin crew who threaten Christmas strikes. Those petty tabloid editors whose papers are the pits full of trivia and gossip and those huge enormous bits. <laughs> and girls who peddle stories of the Tories they have kissed. They'd none of them be missed. They'd none of them be missed. Got them on the list, he's got them on the list, and they none of them be missed, they none of them be missed. The income tax expector who finds fault with my accounts, I wish he would desist, he's high up on my list. The traffic warden hiding round the corner sets to pounce. I don't think he'll be missed. I'm sure he'll not be missed. The people who block supermarket aisles with their carts. Celebrities who accidentally show their private parts. Those morons on the buses who talk loud on mobile phones and think they can impress us with their novelty ringtones. And those whose constant texting must be injuring their wrists. They'd none of them be missed. They'd none of them be missed. He's got them on the list. He's got them on the list. And they none of them be missed. They'd none of them be missed. <laughs> the Mikado, Gilbert and Sullivan's most popular opera, ran for 672 performances and gave them the chance to follow other pursuits. It was events such as writing the Golden Legend, Sullivan's greatest choral work. It was eventually succeeded by Rudigore, a takeoff of Victorian melodrama concerning a family with a curse on it, requiring the current holder to commit a crime every day for life. Although it contains much excellent music and the finest scene in the whole of GNS, in my, scene, in, in my view, in which a whole gallery of portraits comes to life, as in ages ago, Rudigore turned out not to be popular. More successful was its successor, the Yeoman of the Guard, their most serious and possibly their finest work. It concerns Elsie Maynard, a strolling player who's engaged to Jack Point, a jester. They need to raise some money for her invalid mother and Elsie's offered a hundred crowns if she agrees to marry a courageous soldier, Colonel Fairfax, who is about to be beheaded. After the marriage ceremony has taken place, Elsie sings of her mental torment.
Last GNS success was the Gondoliers, probably the sunniest of all their collaborations. It concerns two gondoliers, Marco and Giuseppe, one of whom is believed to be the king of Barataria, but no one can decide which. They're sent to the island of Barataria to wait until the king's foster mother can come to identify the right one. After three months there, Marco misses female company and sings his famous aria take a pair of sparkling eyes, incidentally written by Sullivan at 5 a.m. at the end of a marathon 12-hour composing session. <laughs> Take a pair of rosy lips. Take a figure to live such as admiration wears. Be particular in this. Take a tender little hand, fit with dainty finger rest. Press it, press it in the lenses. Furnishes upon the spot 
with the treasures rich and rare, I didn't ever stood his high. Live to love and love to live, you will ripen at your ease, growing on the sunny side. Taste has nothing more to give, you're a dainty man to please. If you're not satisfied, not satisfied, Act upon it if you can, if you can, take my counsel, happy man, act upon it if you can, if you can, take my counsel, happy man, act upon it if you can. If you can, if you can, act upon it if you can. high time that you had another chance to sing. So here's the finale uh, of the whole of the gondoliers, once more gondolieri. In your book it's chorus number 25 on page 190. for the top C, eh? <laughs> During the run of the gondoliers, Gilbert, Sullivan and Doily Cart fought a disastrous legal battle over the cost, cost of a carpet for the front of the Savoy Theatre. And sadly, things were never quite the same again. In the 1890s, they wrote two further operas, both of which contained some fine music but neither was particularly successful. The first of these was Utopia Limited, which the Oxford University uh, Gilbert Sullivan Society performed up at Buxton uh, last year, um, and was mainly memorable for the fact that I was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and a grass skirt. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> fortunately, I didn't bring those tonight. <laughs> Um, Utopia Limited was a, whiting, uh, was a witty and biting satire on many of England's institutions. Zara, the daughter of the king of the island of Utopia, has just come back from Cambridge determined to remodel Utopia on English lines to the horror of the king's two spin doctors, Scafio and Fantis, who sing of their displeasure. And here are the Scafio and Fantis from the Buxton production. <coughs> Law, the law, the statement smacks of 
identity which came right before for the wise of humanity as gifts of hidden heart and heart we wasted on utility the cast to play a part a part great responsibility our duty is to spy by on our king's illicities keep a watchful eye on all his eccentricities if ever a trick he tries he tries to save us of rascality by our decree he dies he dies without the least formality. We fear no rude rebuff, rebuff on newspapers' publicity. Our words quite enough. Enough. The rest is electricity. A pound of dynamite, a might explode in his auriculars. It's not to flare and size and sight that's failed our particulars. It's forced all men confess. Confess. Our king needs no admonishing. We may say it's success. Success. It's something quite astonishing. Our despotic views and views with virtues quite delectable. He might defeat and cues and cues and keeps himself respectable. Of a trident for life, he's a paragon wife, so modest and mild. He's waiting a child, and no one ever met with an autocrat yet. To the light, to the blood, to the least, to the last, to the light, to the to the least, to the last, to the last, to the What do you like at singing church music? We're going to follow this with the Utopia Chorus Eagle High, which, like Hale Poetry, reminds us of Sullivan's long, a lifelong involvement with church music. It's chorus number 26 on page 196, and it's preceded by a recitative by King Paramount. <laughs> This ceremonial our wish displays to copy all Great Britain's courtly ways. Though lofty aims catastrophe entail, we'll gloriously succeed. Oh, no.
Alban Sullivan's last opera was The Grand Duke, of which you'll say nothing, I never could sort out the plot, uh, except that Rudolph, the Grand Duke himself, is obviously suffering from every kind of illness under the sun. When you find you're a broken down critter, who is all in a tremble and twitter, with your palate unpleasantly bitter, as if you've just bitten a pill. When your legs are as thin as dividers, and you're plagued with unruly insiders, and your spine is all creepy with spiders, and you're highly gamboge in the kill. Creepy. Creepy. When you've got a beehive in your head, and a sewing machine in each ear, and you feel that you've eaten your bed, and you've got a bad headache, a headache down here. When such facts are about, and these symptoms you find in your body or clown, it's a shady lookout, you must make up your mind that you'd better lie down. Go at once, go at once, and lie down. When your lips are all smeary like tallow, and your tongue is decidedly yellow, with a pint of warm oil in your swallow, and a pound of tin tacks in your chest. When you're down in the mouth with the vapors, and all over your Morris war papers, black beetles are cutting their capers, and crawly things never at rest. Crawly things, crawly things. When you doubt if your head is your own, and you jump when an open door slams, well, you've got to a state, to a state which is known to the medical world as Jim Jams. When such symptoms you find in your body or head, they're not easy to quell. You may make up your mind you are better in bed, for you're not at all well. No, you're not at all well. Not at all well. Sullivan died in 1900, while Gilbert survived until 1911, drowning in a lake in his Harrow home while trying to save the lives of two young ladies who were swimming there. But I thought we should end on a happier note, and we conclude this evening's concert with a fine double chorus from the Pirates of Penzance, where the Sergeant of Police is valiantly attempting to rally his nervous band of men to face the evil pirates while the Major General's daughters inspire them to go to glory and the grave. It's chorus number eight in your books on page 40.